good results in the end. <laughs> On to more serious matters. This morning we'll be giving out a letter uh, from Clyde Presbytery. I hope you've all got a copy of it. And uh, it gives you a flavour of the challenge that the church nationally as well as locally is facing at the current time. The letter has been circulated to all churches in the presbytery and it's part of a regular set of conversations that have been taking place in recent months um, in various cluster groups. So we're part of, um, Corinne will keep me right here, we're part of the East Duke East cluster group. I'll be asking questions later, there will be points for this. There is also an East Nuke Gateway cluster um, and we have had a joint conversation with the two clusters as well as our individual conversations about the shape of the church in this area in the years to come. No decisions are being made at the moment but there will be a need to make decisions soon and this is part of giving people information and helping people to try to be part of the process. The Presbytery is keen that the process is owned by the people of the church, not just being delivered as a top-down process. But what is clear is the Church of Scotland has to embrace change and it has to be realistic about what it can and cannot do in the years to come. That all sounds quite negative, but what can, I can assure you is we are doing everything we can, everything within our power, to ensure that Kilgreny has a future. There's no current suggestion of any threat to us. Okay? So this will be very clear about that. I appreciate it's easy to get carried away with the thought that that's us, we're done. Um, but that's not the case at the current time. And Calling your first session myself, we will all work as hard as we can to keep it that way. That's part of the reason that we've been talking to King's Barons and just seeing how churches like ourselves in the Adventure can work more closely together to ensure we have a mutual future. But we have to continue to work hard to develop these relationships. And we have to explore how we can be church in this community and how we can encourage others to join us. It's not good enough, unfortunately, just for us to keep turning up on a Sunday morning. Because eventually, you know as well as I do, there'll be nobody left to turn up. So we do have to encourage others to join us. Young, old, in between. The more we can encourage the people we can encourage to join us, the more secure the future becomes. So for the moment, let's be positive. Let's move forward with hope and trust that God is looking after us and has a plan for us. Whatever that plan may be, and it may not be the one we think he should have. Right, so, that's a serious bit. The good bit is we've got tea and coffee after the service today. Hooray! You can come and join us. Socially distanced and all the other things, but it's great to be able to come and, and share in fellowship after worship. And just a reminder for the cup session that we have a meeting after the service next Sunday, Sunday the 13th. Um, and I know you know about it because Corinne has been emailing out like a fury this week. Um, you've got lots of lots of homework to do and reading to do. So have I. But that's very necessary and very important that we do that. So thank you to Corinne for making sure that we are on top of everything we need to be. <coughs> Let us come before God. Let's join together in the responses on the intimation sheet. We come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts. We bow our knee before you to praise your name. We praise you for your constant love and faithfulness. You have never failed us, O Lord. 
You answer us when we call. You strengthen strength us. You fulfill your promises. Your love is eternal. Amen. So with a spirit of positivity and hopefulness, let us sing our first hymn, Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy, in 166. <laughs>
Jesus, we thank you for all you mean to us and all you have done for us. We thank you that you call each of us by name and that with your disciples of old, we too are called to serve you and your people. We confess that sometimes we know we are not ready to serve. We are too caught up with ourselves and our own selfish desires. For that we seek your forgiveness. We confess that sometimes we know we don't have the ability to serve. We're too angry at ourselves for what we have said that we know we shouldn't have, or what we have done that we know we shouldn't have. For that, Lord, we seek your forgiveness. We confess that sometimes we know we can't serve you. We are too annoyed at ourselves for what we should have said and failed to say, or what we should have done but failed to do. For that, Lord, we seek your forgiveness. Lord, we know that you are slow to anger and abounding in love. So may we rest in that love, knowing that we have, can have a fresh start, that today is the beginning of a new journey with you. So Holy Spirit, encourage us to hear you calling now. Holy Spirit, enable us and teach us to fulfill our calling. Holy Spirit, empower and sustain us in our service. Thank you, Lord God. We are ready to serve. So hear our praise this day. As we join our voices together in the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for them. Amen. Let us sing again from the hymn number 482. Come, let us to the Lord our God. 482.
first lesson this morning is taken from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, the first 11 verses. The section is entitled, The Resurrection of Christ. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, you if you hold firmly to the word that I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I have received, I passed on to you as of the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preached, and this is what you believed. And then turning to the Gospel reading in Luke chapter 5, once again the first 11 verses, the calling of the first disciples. One day, as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the Word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore and left everything and followed him here in the distance. Thank you for that. So let us sing the hymn 340. When Jesus saw the fishermen,
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord. Amen. The image of the fishermen being called by Jesus from their boats to become fishers of men is one of the most recognisable in all the New Testament stories. It's so powerful in so many ways. Here are a group of men working hard, earning their living in a precarious trade, giving it all up to follow this man, who shows them that there is more to life than casting nets into a lake. No doubt there's more to the story than that. Jesus probably was probably well known to them. They may have grown up with him, been friends with him, or heard him preach in the synagogue. Whatever the circumstances, they collectively made the biggest decision of their lives and walked away from all they knew to begin a new life. A life filled with even more uncertainty and risk than anything they had ever done before. What must it take to do that? How charismatic must Jesus have been to engender that response in these intensely practical men? Last week we spoke about turning points in our lives, the turning point for Jesus when he was rejected by the people of Nazareth. And today we're seeing the impact of his that his rebirth had on others. Firstly, the fishermen, Simon, Peter, James and John, and later, after his death and resurrection, the calling of Paul to become his most successful disciple in terms of taking the good news beyond the confines of the Jewish world to the wider Roman Empire. Paul, the man who persecuted the church, became its greatest advocate. One of the things that immediately strikes me as a common thread in these stories is that both Peter and Paul claim how unworthy and unsuited they are to be Jesus' followers. For one of the great characteristics of Jesus is he chooses those who are so often overlooked by others, those who seem unsuited to greatness or authority. The quality of humility is a wonderful quality to have. And I've met many wonderfully humble people. People who walk quietly in the background serving their Lord and Master faithfully. But there is a time when we must step out of the shadows and do as Peter did on the day of Pentecost. Stand up and preach the good news without fear or favour. Praising God and offering salvation to those who believe. Or, who like Paul, are willing to brave the hostile stare, willing to be imprisoned for their faith, knowing that God is with them. Paul, the man who was chased out of many Greek cities, man who stoned, beaten up, thrown in prison on a number of occasions, reminds us of how hard he worked. Fortunately for us, in our society we are rarely persecuted for our faith, but something worse has been happening for many years. We have been quietly ignored and made to feel irrelevant to the needs of the modern world. Of course, Jesus and God are not irrelevant, and God's patient, but not patient enough. He expects us to be vocal on his behalf, to still be his people in this place and to preach his good news of a redeeming gospel. We need to find the means to do these things, to step out of our church buildings so that we can be heard and we can be seen as God's people. Peter, James and John became the people Jesus relied on most during his earthly ministry. Paul became the greatest of his preachers, taking the good news to new places, new audiences, often at great personal risk. 
Since those early days, there have been many thousands of God's people who have done likewise. In Scotland, we have the great saints of Ninian and Columba, establishing their monastic settlements from where they reached out across the land to preach God's word. The question for us is who are the modern day saints who will continue their legacy? Who will dedicate themselves to the task of taking God's word to those who have not heard it before or those who have never listened? Now is as good a time as ever for the church to find its next hero of faith. Someone who will bring God's word to a new generation. Now we have to look beyond our narrow interests and see God's bigger picture. Our role will be to support whoever God appoints and stand next to whoever that might be. Possibly the most unlikely character we can imagine. Just as he did when he chose his first disciples to follow him to the cross and beyond. Amen. May God add his blessing to these words. So following that thought through, let us sing our next hymn, hymn 533. Will you come and call me if I but call your name? Find me.
teaching and preaching your gospel of redemption. So bless these offerings and bless us as human offerings to you. Blessed are you, Lord our God, for you have called us to know you, to love you and to serve you. We rejoice in your presence and in your love for us. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We give you thanks, O God, for all who have served you faithfully throughout the ages. We thank you especially today for the prophet Isaiah and for the disciples. We ask your blessing upon all who are called to preach the word and to celebrate the sacraments. We pray for theological colleges and their students and for all your people in their various locations. Father, as you have called us, give us the power to serve We ask your blessing upon all who feel drained of resources or energy. We remember those who are handicapped by poverty or by the prejudice of others. We pray for people who feel they have lost their way or who have been cast aside by society. We remember the street children of the world and those who live in slums or favelas. This morning, Lord, we remember the family of the little boy who did not survive his time in the well in Morocco. We ask you be especially close to them. Take that little one to your heart and hold that family close to your chest. Father, as you have called us, give us the power to serve you. We give thanks that you have called us to know you, and we pray that we may live in your glory. May our homes and our relationships reflect our love for you. We remember before you homes where there is tension or violence, where there is neglect and a lack of respect for each other. We remember families where the news this week about energy bills is a straw that might break the camel's back, where choices between heating and eating become an everyday reality. We pray today, Lord, for our own church, that choices for the future are made prayerfully and with understanding. We acknowledge that many of our churches are almost empty, lacking in the basic resources for long-term survival. We ask that the faithful few are comforted and rewarded for their service in the face of overwhelming odds. We pray that we may be filled with your Holy Spirit and continue to serve in your strength to maintain your worship and to draw others into your glory. We pray for all who are called to the healing professions. We ask your blessing on doctors and surgeons, on nurses and ambulance crews. Especially at this time, we pray for those who have served throughout the COVID crisis, those who have cared and comforted, held the hands of the dying and the bereaved. We pray for all who are ill at home or in hospital. And we remember those who are unable to cope on their own. And now, in the silence of our hearts, we bring before you all those we know of in need of your care, your comfort, your compassion, and your love. We remember in your presence friends and loved ones who have departed from us. May they share with your saints in the glory of your kingdom. Merciful Father, 
Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour and Lord, Jesus Christ. Let us close our worship this morning by singing from the hymn book, hymn 110, Glory be to God the Father, 110. These things we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.